Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat. Uh, Glad that you are here. Glad that I am here. Glad we get to do this together. Whether you are in the room or online with us, uh, it is a delight to be sharing with you tonight. And I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is our text tonight. And if you don't have a Bible and you're in the room, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1083. And uh, you will find Acts chapter 4, and you'll be able to follow along with us. Uh, And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, you don't own one, and you want one, then please take that with you. Uh, We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. And if you're watching, uh, or joining with us online, worshiping with us online, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please uh, let us know. We'll be glad to send one to you, get one to you any way that we can. Hey, uh, if also, for those of you that are joining us online, uh, we're going to be celebrating communion later in the service, so uh, I would encourage you right now just to, to, if you haven't already gotten some elements together, grab some crackers or bread, some juice, some wine, have it ready uh, for when we as the congregation celebrate communion together later in the service. So in, uh, in 1991, I was the student pastor in South Georgia at Vine Memorial Baptist Church. And I uh, had been there for a while, but uh, it really felt like God was moving me to someplace else. And so I was just seeking Him, and, uh, and I actually had uh, several churches that I'd interviewed with for student pastor, and I wanted to go to them, okay? I mean, it was kind of like, okay, God, open this door, because I am ready to rush through. Uh, these are attractive places to serve, and, and I wanted to be there for all kinds of reasons. Uh, ego and money were two of them. Uh, but... Uh, but, you know, because I, I wanted God to lead me to those places. And, uh, and two of those churches, it came down to me and another candidate, and they picked the other guy. And the third church, I was the only candidate. One of my friends was on staff. He says it's a slam dunk, and they also rejected me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, you know, yeah, some of you were, like, symp- you know, showing that sympathy. And, uh, and, and it was a season of disappointment. It was a season of rejection. And I was like, God, what are you doing? And and then this little church in Lake Havasu City invited me to be their pastor 28 years ago. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of worked out okay. All right. So uh, I'm just saying that in those seasons of disappointment and unhappiness, uh, well, let's just say I'm thankful for those rejections that I experienced. I'm thankful for the, the feelings of failure and disappointment that I lived through Because if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I want you to understand God is working in your life. God is working in your life. This is not theoretical. This is actual. He he is trying to grow you. He's trying to lead you. And sometimes... He does it in unexpected and unsettling ways. Let me say that again. Sometimes God leads us, sometimes God is working in us in unexpected and unsettling ways. Uh, Like the last six months, right? I I mean, it's been unsettling, it's been unexpected. Uh, Without warning, everything suddenly changed. I mean, plans were canceled. I mean, how many of you either, uh, you know, had to cancel a trip or a celebration or some kind of conference thing that you were going to? Okay. All right. Lots of hands went up. Okay. How many of you had your jobs impacted? Either you got laid off or reduced hours or you had to work from home? Okay. A lot of you. Okay. And I can't even see the hands being raised at home. You guys are raising your hands at home, right? You know, unless you're alone in the room, you ought to at least be expressing uh, something when I ask questions. You know, answer them out loud. But schools were impacted. Entertainment and sports, you know, were radically changed. Personal interaction seems forever altered. You know, this whole social distancing thing that none of us knew about six months ago suddenly dominates every conversation. And yet, God redeems. Okay, I mean, this, these changes impacted Calvary. I mean, let's just say it for what it is. Before COVID hit and, and shut everything down, we were averaging over 2,000 people uh, attending on-site a weekend. Uh, our children and student ministries were growing. They were just gearing, gearing up for, you know, camp season and mission trip season and, and all that goes with that. And, and suddenly, 
everything just stopped. Just stopped. And we grieved. I mean, right? It felt like a disaster for everything. I mean, we weren't having services and no activities and no mission trips. And I mean, we literally were like 36 hours from getting on a plane to Honduras when everything got shut down. So we go, okay, this is a disaster. But I want you to understand God redeems. God redeems. So in the last six months, while all this has been going on, as, as a church, we've launched an online campus. I mean, we had talked about it, like, someday down the road, uh, but it ended up happening in a week. Okay? It, it, but it, it's now, it, it's, it's viable, and it's going to be up, and it's going to be going. We're looking for, for staff, someone to pastor that. Uh, so, so we've launched an online campus. And, and here's the crazy thing. We have averaged more people participating online than on site. Okay? So this is, yeah, yeah you guys can clap. What I really want to hear is people online clapping, but uh, I can't do that. But see, here's the thing. Uh, so I told you we averaged over 2,000 in, in attendance, uh, you know, on site before COVID. And, and uh, but the, the, between the people who've been watching when we we're online only or when we've been combination, you know, like now, where there's on site and online, we've averaged about 500 more people a weekend than a year ago, same time period. Is that crazy or what? Yeah, see, God, God redeems. So we can't meet, but we reach more people. And, and in evidence of that is in the last six months, we've seen 127 people confess Jesus publicly in baptism. See, that, I, just, I, I go, praise God. If he has to shut us down to reach people, okay. See, it's unexpected, but God is always redeeming us, even when life takes surprising and unexpected turns. So we're in Acts chapter 4 tonight. Uh, we're in the book of Acts. It's a great story of the early church, and we're learning from them and following them. And, and last week, Peter and John, uh, they healed a man on their way into the temple. Okay? And, and, uh, and this man was suddenly healed, and he, you know, started leaping and shouting and dancing and jumping around with this, you know, enthusiastic celebration, and a crowd gathered, and Peter and John preached, and everything is going great until the story suddenly takes a turn. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, first four verses, and it says, And as they, Peter and John, were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed. I love that. Greatly annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They were the leaders of Judaism, they were the chief priests, and they did not believe in resurrection of the dead. And so they were greatly annoyed. And verse 3, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So get this. The first surprise is that you get to serve God and suffer. Serve God and suffer. I mean, here they were the apostles. They were faithful they're serving. I mean, they're preaching and healing people. And, and, and they are effective. Many people are believing. And they get arrested. They get arrested for doing exactly what God wanted them to do. I want to pause the story right here because sometimes we think, and I say we because sometimes I think this way and I've talked to other people, we think if I follow Jesus, if I obey the Bible, if I serve God, if I seek God with all my heart, then God's going to bless me and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's going to be safe and I'm not going to have to suffer. There's gonna, God's going to keep me away from pain and hardship and all of that. And, and it's kind of our unspoken deal with God. Right? We're kind of going, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you and I'm going to obey the Bible and I'm going to serve you and, and, I, and you're going to bless me. Now, here's the thing. If you follow Jesus and you obey the Bible and you serve God, you're going to be blessed. But I want you to understand that Jesus promised suffering as part of the journey following him. Okay, let me say that again. Jesus promised suffering. He didn't promise escape from suffering. He didn't promise that you wouldn't ever be hurt. In, in fact, he promised just the opposite, but we miss that sometimes. Actually, we miss that a lot. We ignore it. We don't want to hear it. In, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, 
if any of you would come after me, if any of you would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, we think of crosses as decorations and as reminders. We wear them around our necks. We put them up in rooms and say, okay, it reminds me that Jesus loves me. But to the people listening to that, a cross was only an implement of torture. It didn't represent hope. It didn't represent salvation. It represented pain, torture, and death. That's it. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, then you've got to grab hold of that. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of Jesus. I have never yet woken up in the morning and asked God to bless me through persecution. Okay? Hasn't happened yet in my life. I've never said, God, I want to be blessed that way. Or in John chapter 16, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you can have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. That, that's a promise, okay? In the world, you will have tribulation, but don't worry about it. Don't take courage. I've overcome the world. I mean, these are, these are statements from Jesus that say, hey, you're going to go ahead and serve me and suffer. It's part of the deal. The apostles Paul and James both described suffering and trials as the building blocks of Christian character. In other words, God uses the pain and suffering to make us look more and more like Jesus. So suffering can have a godly purpose. God wants to redeem your pain, your suffering, your injustice to make us look like Jesus. Because that's his goal, right? We want to follow Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. We want to imitate God as dearly loved children. And, and that means that, well, Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Uh, so we need to kind of be aware of this truth and acknowledge that if we serve God, suffering's part of that. Pain's part of that. So please don't be surprised if you suffer. So that's the first surprise is serve God and suffer. And then the next surprise is we see this astounding life change. An astounding life change. Let's continue the story. Uh, verse 5 says, On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them, that's John and Peter, in their midst, they inquired, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, and by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the elders, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They recognized they had been with Jesus. Did you, did you listen to that passage? Because this is a wow kind of passage. This is an amazing transition. First of all, this is about six months to a year since Jesus was crucified. So we're talking about less than a year from the time that these same men put Jesus on trial and condemned him to death, handed him over to Pilate, manipulated the process, and got Jesus executed. And, and remember Peter... Six months earlier, when all this was going on, what did he do? He denied knowing Jesus to a servant girl, the servants of these men. He, he couldn't even stand up to their servants. And now, less than a year later, he boldly proclaims Jesus. And don't you love it? I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but he actually accuses them of executing the Messiah. I mean, all of Israel is looking for the Messiah. And he says, guys, the Messiah was right here in your midst, and you killed him. 
You killed him, but guess what? God raised him from the dead. He declares the resurrection of Jesus, and then, I love this part, he tells them they need to be saved. He tells them, you guys need salvation through Jesus because there's salvation in no one else. This is not a group of degenerates that are out partying on the lake. Okay, this is not a bunch of people that are, are, you know, just out, you know, filling themselves with alcohol and drugs and wasting their lives. These are the religious leaders of the nation. I mean, it's the Jewish Pope. Okay, it's the, it's the Jewish pastors of the megachurches. It's the guys that everybody looked to as the best of the best of the spiritual leaders of the entire nation. They are descendants uh, of Aaron, the first priest. And Peter, who doesn't have any education, just looks at him and says, hey, by the way, guys, without Jesus, you don't have any hope. I mean, that's, that's just amazing. I mean, how does this all happen? Well, this is what life change looks like, by the way. Th this is an example of life change. This is what surrendering to the Holy Spirit results in. And, and you know the key phrase in all of this? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. They recognized they'd been with Jesus. That was the difference maker. It, it wasn't, uh, you know, their education. It wasn't their background. It wasn't their wealth. It was their relationship with Jesus. So here's a question that I hope haunts you way beyond this sermon. Can anyone tell that you've been with Jesus? Can your friends and family tell that you've been with Jesus? The people in your life tell that you've been with Jesus. Does your life reveal it in any way? Do your words express it? In any way, do, do your, does your character show it? You know, when, when you're frustrated, when you're disappointed, when you're rejected, when you're offended. And I know we can make excuses all we want. I don't have time. I've never been to Bible college or seminary. I'm not a pastor. Peter and John were uneducated common men. Look, I studied higher education for 10 years seminary, earned a doctorate, all that kind of stuff, that, that actually doesn't provide any authority for ministry. You know what it does? This book and spending time with Jesus. That's it. That's where the authority comes from, for me and for you. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, then God the Holy Spirit is in you, and, and He gives you that authority if you'll hang out with Him, spend time with Jesus, and learn His Word. Why, why was Peter able to share this? Because he'd been with Jesus. And, and the next surprise, I don't know if you caught this one, the next surprise is the, the defining statement from Peter. He says salvation is only through Jesus. Right? There is salvation in no one else. There's no other name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved. No other name, no other way. This is it. Now, this is a shock to the listeners. This is a complete surprise to these priests, these high priests, these chief priests, all these guys, because they believe salvation was through their birthright and following the law. They believe they were born saved because they were Jewish. They were descendants of Abraham. They're the chosen people. God loves them more than he loves anybody else. And so they thought, okay, we're in because we're of our birthright and because we're keeping the law. And Peter says, no, no. You need to confess Jesus as Messiah, as Lord, as Savior. That's the only way you have any hope. And Peter tells them this because he was with Jesus. John chapter 3 records what Peter heard, I'm sure, more than once. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him, in the Son, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. Or how about John 14, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, that's Jesus. So Peter just echoed Jesus, and he said, look, guys, there's salvation in no one else. It's not possible. Now, I want you to understand, this is why we do what we do at Calvary. I mean, you, maybe it's your first time here. Maybe you've been here a, a hundred times, and you got, kind of look around and go, hey, you guys do some really cool stuff. Why do you do all the stuff you do? And, and I'm telling you, the reason is because salvation is in no one else. That, that's why we do the ministries that we do. That's why we preach the way we do. That's why we, we do worship the way we do. That's why we serve our community the way we do. All of this stuff, the, the reason we send missionaries and drill wells and build compassion centers and launch campuses is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Because salvation is in no one else. And that's why we want you to invite your, your friends and your family to worship with you on site or to watch with you online. Because salvation is in no one else. That's why we want you to serve the community. That's why we want you to reflect the character of Jesus in every relationship, in every situation, in business and at home and at school and any place you go. Because salvation is in no one else. Now, usually at this point, someone protests, not out loud, but in their minds. They kind of mentally fold their arms and go, yeah, but Pastor Chad, that's, that's really kind of exclusive. I mean, is Jesus really the only way? I mean, there's so many religions out there and so many good people. It just doesn't seem very fair of God. And what I would say to you is I appreciate your heart because like you, I want everybody to make it to heaven. Okay? I, I really do. But the truth is we only get to go to heaven on God's terms. Okay, let me say it again. We only get to go to heaven on God's terms. And, and, and some of you are even struggling thinking that's not very fair. But it's kind of like every professional sporting event on the planet. How many of you have ever been to a professional sporting event? Of any kind, okay. So uh, I've had the privilege of going to the Masters Golf Tournament about five times. Uh, if you don't know what the Masters is, the Masters is the Super Bowl of golf, okay? It's very exclusive. The people who run the tournament are the people who are the members of Augusta National Golf Club in Savannah, Georgia, or Augusta, Georgia, excuse me, I got that wrong for a second. Augusta, Georgia, and, and so they make the rules and they invite the golfers and all this kind of stuff. And so if you wanna go, and by the way, I get to go because I, I married well, and my wife's family has had tickets for over 40, uh, close to 50 years. And, and so, uh, so if you want to go, you have to go by their rules. And, and they've got crazy rules. They, they do like airport, better than airport security. And you go through and they look at everything in your bag. You got to bring it out and show it to them what it is. And, and here's the rules. The, recently, you know, since cell phones became popular, they have a rule that says no cell phones at all, period, zip, no cell phones. For the whole day, if you want in, you got to leave your cell phone in the car. It's like going back to the dark ages or the 90s, uh, either way. But, but here's the thing. If you want to go to the masters, you got to do it. Their rules. The phone stays in the car. You go inside, enjoy beautiful place, beautiful golf uh, at the Super Bowl of golf. Okay, that's the choice. But here's the thing. You only get in if you play by their rules. Uh, if you don't like their rules, they don't care. But you don't get to go. Heaven belongs to God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? So he owns heaven. And, G and God said Jesus is the only way to get there. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. If you want to go to heaven, it is God's way only. Otherwise, you don't get to go. So who's going to heaven? Hey, if you're watching online, they didn't make any noise. They just raised their hand. <laughs> so who's going to heaven? <laughs> All right, that's cool. They're, they're excited now. If you're watching at home, you guys need to make some noise too. So I'll ask it one more time, okay? Who's going to heaven? <laughs> See, I... I'm excited that you're going to heaven. I want to go to heaven. And, and here's the thing. I don't want to go alone. I want to take some people with me. 
And, and I'm assuming you do too. If you're going to go to heaven, why don't you take someone with you? Because you don't go any place great alone. You know, how many of you have been to Disneyland? A lot of hands. Did you go there alone? No. Some of you are like, well, I met friends there. You didn't go alone then. That would really suck, wouldn't it? I'm in an amusement park all by myself, watching families have fun. Yeah, that would not be cool. Don't want to go to Disney alone. Hey, if you've been to a pro event, did you go to the, the football game or the, the motorcycle? Did you go to the, the sporting event alone? No. I don't even think they sell single tickets, like just for an individual. It'd be awkward. Okay, let's do this. How many of you have ever been to a movie by yourself? See, a lot of hands go to movies. Okay, that's so you can't talk to the people around you? That's good. Be good discipline. Did you want to go to the movie alone? Oh, some of you are saying yes. Okay. I'll leave that out tomorrow. Uh, so, well, it didn't work, okay? Here's the thing. You're going to heaven. It's better than any place you've ever been. It's better than anything you can even imagine. Why in the world would we want to, want to go alone? Why would we want to go alone? Let's invite our friends. Let's invite our family. Let's take as many people as we can with us. So salvation is only through Jesus. And then the final surprise I want you to see in this is single allegiance. Skip down to verse 18. So they, the, the Sanhedrin, called Peter and John in and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you have to judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So they threatened them and said, we forbid you to tell anyone else about Jesus. You can't do anything in his name. You can't talk about his name. And Peter and John said, um, hey, as Jewish men who love their nation and love their God, said, you decide whether we are, should obey you or God, but we're going to obey God. We're going to obey God. We're going to tell what we have seen and heard. And, and so we're going to be bold. We're going to be brave. We're going to be faithful because they had a single allegiance to the living God. They were going to follow God and no one else. Period. So let me ask you this. What is stopping you from proclaiming the life-changing power of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, what is preventing you from proclaiming his life-changing power? See, if you believe salvation is, is actually only through Jesus, there's only two reasons that you don't tell people about Jesus. The first reason is you've stopped believing in God's power to change lives. You say, oh, no, I, I believe in God's power to change lives. But there are churches all across this country that preach Jesus, but they don't actually believe that God will change anybody. I know because I've been a part of those churches. It's sad. It's sad. See, honestly, I believe God has the power to change your life today. No matter how messed up your, your life is, God can forgive you, he can heal you, he can restore you, he can redeem your failures and mistakes. And I believe it because, first of all, he's done it in my life. And secondly, I have seen it over and over and over again in the lives of the Calvary family. I know that God can redeem your life. And here's the thing. When you believe God can redeem anyone, you'll invite everyone. If you don't believe God can redeem anyone, you won't invite anyone. Second reason people don't tell how Jesus changed their life is because they haven't experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus. You can't share what you don't have. And, and it doesn't matter how religious you are or how faithful you are or how often you show up or, or how well you play the games or how well you know the verbiage and you can give all the answers. If Jesus Christ hasn't changed you on the inside, then you don't have anything to challenge people with. You're not going to invite somebody to experience life change that you haven't experienced. And, and here's the thing, we're not interested in you becoming a member of Calvary. We're not interested in, in you just showing up. We want to see Jesus Christ change your life. And if he hasn't done that, then that means that you haven't surrendered fully to Jesus. Your allegiance isn't yet to Jesus, it's still to yourself. You're still trying to bargain with God, you're still trying to manipulate God, you're still trying to be the one who's in control, and that doesn't work. 
The only way it works is to be like Peter and John and have one allegiance, and that is to God and God alone. And you say, God, you can have your way with me. I will do whatever you ask me to do. I belong to you. And if you've never done that, if you haven't made that commitment, I don't care how many times you stood in front of the crowd and said you believe in Jesus. I don't care if you just yelled, I'm going to heaven. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. If you haven't done it, then stop pretending and begin surrendering tonight. Take that step of surrender to Jesus and invite him to change your life because that's what he came to do. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. And we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us life in Jesus who, who gave his life so that we could be redeemed, so that we could belong to your family, so that we could have the promise of heaven. And God, right now, we just surrender again to you. Have your way in our lives. And God, we want to live out that life change. We want to be bold and courageous. We want to share the, the hope we have in Jesus because he really can change anyone's life. So meet us here as we worship you. Speak into our hearts and into our lives. And, and Father, let us leave this place in a way that tells people that we have been with you. In Jesus' name, amen.